Hello everyone. If you wish to join me tonight, we are going to spend the next hour or so exploring a vibrant, colorful and fleeting world, Impressionism. We will take a look at a lot of Impressionist works together. Some of them you probably know, or they will look familiar to you. And I will tell you about this movement. What is it really about? Why did it appear in the 19th century? And what does it tell us about the history of painting and visual arts in general? But more importantly, we will enjoy these works. Impressionist paintings are easy to appreciate at first sight because they are often lively and appeasing at the same time. They easily transmit emotions. They are full of colors. This makes them appealing on many levels. But they are even more enjoyable when we know a bit more about them how they were made, by whom, where do they stand between realism and abstraction. I will also tell you about many big names of painting, not all of them Impressionists. Turner, Delacroix, Monet, Manet and others. To help you navigate this video, there are timestamps in the first comment. And if you would like to download it in HD or just the audio track, you can do it together with dozens more on my Patreon page. There is a link in the video's description. For once, I'm not asking you to close your eyes, but rather open them and watch. Following a lot of requests, I have chosen to add background music. If you would like a video about art without music, you can check my playlist also in the description. So, let's begin. It is easy to quickly identify what is called an Impressionist painting. From far, it looks realistic. At mid-distance, it looks a bit blur, and plenty of different colors show up on the canvas many more than we would have imagined at first sight. And from very close, the shapes and the perspectives dissolve into many small brush strokes or spots of color. They also tend to be vibrating, almost moving when we compare them with all the more classical works, and what they represent is rather ordinary. Landscapes, plants, a few buildings and people, but there are no grand scenes, no glorious battles, no depiction of mythological events. There is a simplicity to them at least to what they depict. But they are not abstract works, neither, like a lot of 20th century paintings. We know that they represent a real scene from the material world. None of this is random. Impressionism is the product of multiple factors that converged at some point. 
the search for a new style that would be less academic. New paints and pigments available to painters. The invention of photography that redefined the status of fine painting. The general movement of ideas and art in the 19th century. Plus a number of individual painters who manage to grasp all this, consciously or not, and who invented a new visual language. To understand this, we have to take a look at what painting was by the middle of the 19th century, before Impressionism. At the time, by the years 1850-1860, The academic world, what we could call official art, was dominated by a neoclassical approach to painting. Very clear lines, a search for highly realistic scenes. The themes that were the most praised were also inspired by history or the antiquity. Scenes from the mythology, Roman history, And in terms of painting, of technique, neoclassical works favored drawing with these uh, well-defined outlines rather than blurred transitions between colors. It hadn't always been the case over the past centuries. Many painters from the uh, early Renaissance also had this taste for very well-defined, clear lines, and they would add realism or subtlety to their works by using effects of transparency with multiple very thin layers of paint. This approach to painting went on in the following centuries, but by the end of the Renaissance, and during the Baroque period. It was overshadowed by a freer use of brush strokes and more importance given to color over lines, outlines. This is what you see in the works of some Venetian masters, Velasquez, Rembrandt, Rubens, and by the 18th century, This way of painting culminated with the late Baroque painters, the period called Rococo, painters like Fragonard. The paintings were colorful, vaporous, blurry. It doesn't mean other styles of painting, other techniques didn't coexist with those, but they represented the, the taste of the moment. By the end of the 18th century, there was a clear break with Baroque art and a return to simpler lines, inspired by the Greek and Roman antiquity. This movement is called Neoclassical, and it touched a lot of fields, buildings and architecture in general, furniture making, sculpture, and painting. The one painter that embodies this neoclassical movement is called Jacques-Louis David. He became the official painter of Napoleon, and his body of work reflects the taste for the antiquity, for clarity. The buildings and characters in his works are always clearly cut out. The compositions can be complex and full of characters, but they are never blur. Other movements emerged and became successful in the 19th century, especially Romanticism. We'll talk about this in a minute. But for decades, Neoclassicism remained a reference in the academic world, especially in France. 
what academic world means here is the uh, institutions, the uh, art critics who had access to newspapers and could communicate on their judgment, official art exhibitions, fine art schools and their teachers. All of these shaped the taste for art and they enforced rules that painters generally had to observe if they wanted to be praised by the critics and commercially successful. There was another criteria inherited from the past in the evaluation of works and painters. It sounds weird to us nowadays. This existed in most European countries, but especially in France until the French Revolution. Painters were specialized based on what they painted, and they had an official license that restricted the kind of orders they could accept. There were portraitists or landscape painters, for example. Some categories were more prestigious than others. The top were painters of historical or mythological scenes, followed by portrait makers, and at the bottom, still life and landscape painters, because their categories were seen as closer to decoration than fine art. The categories and guilds that structured every single activity disappeared suddenly with the French Revolution, but they left traces. Even decades later, landscapes were still considered a minor topic, a minor genre, as opposed to the recreation of historical scenes, for instance. Landscapes would be exactly the kind of subjects the Impressionists would embrace, and this is one of the reasons they were belittled by the Academy of Painting at the beginning. We could say that neoclassicism in the 19th century was the conservative style of painting, but it did produce remarkable works, even though it was an academic style. An example is Ingres, a French painter who completely embraced the neoclassical way of painting, but still innovated in the subject or managed to be slightly subversive with nudes that were quite daring for the time. But in the first half of the 19th century, before Impressionism, the movement that innovated in painting was Romanticism. Romanticism is not just an artistic movement like Neoclassicism, it is broader and touched on all art forms, visual arts, music, literature. It was also an intellectual movement. The characteristics of Romanticism are the emphasis on emotion and individualism. To a certain extent, this was at odds with previous centuries. Romanticism is a very important movement in the history of ideas and societies, because it's a moment when the priority or the primacy of the individual over social norms, religious rules or traditions started to be openly celebrated. Not that this idea was an entirely new aspiration, but it had become broad enough to become visible in Western societies, and there was now an appetite for emotional, introspective literature and art. The first signs of it in painting appeared among several landscape painters in Britain. I told you that landscapes were a minor genre that was considered little more than decoration that they started to choose wilder landscapes or storms, topics that were more emotional and could resonate with the viewer's feelings, 
or become a metaphor for someone's feelings. One of the feelings that romantic artists like to illustrate or cultivate was nostalgia. Nostalgia for a past that was seen as simpler, happier, or more heroic than the present. The most famous of romantic British painters is William Turner. He is known for landscapes and marine paintings that were animated, violent almost, and also for his personal artistic journey that anticipates on Impressionism. Turner lived exactly during the Romantic movement. He was born in 1775, when the first Romantic landscapes appeared, and he died in 1851, when Romanticism as an artistic and literary movement appeared exhausted and had turned less popular. He started painting in a relatively academic manner. But his style evolved into one of the most prominent romantic painters. It is all about emotion and intensity, be it in a violent or more meditative work. He didn't stop there. The more he gained experience, the more he became obsessed with representing the effect of light and trying to go beyond the apparent to communicate emotion. His last works are almost abstract and no longer care about accurately representing something. They try to deliver the uh, essence of it, what you feel when you see them. He was not well understood in his last years, and it's only decades later that his later work was re-evaluated in the light of Impressionism and the beginnings of abstraction in painting. Another emblematic romantic painter is Delacroix. Like Turner, he broke with the rules of neoclassical painting and instead of carefully modeled form or clear outlines, he emphasized movement and color, expression of intensity with his brush strokes. The way Delacroix painted was not entirely new. He was drawing inspiration for his technique from earlier periods I mentioned before like Venetian painters at the end of the Renaissance, or Rubens, and he injected even more motion, action, into his paintings. The rise of Romanticism didn't eliminate neoclassical art. Ingres, that I also mentioned before, as a typical neoclassical painter of the 19th century, was a contemporary and a rival to Delacroix. There could be many other romantic painters to mention, but I focused on these two ones, Turner and Delacroix, because they had an influence in preparing the arrival of Impressionism. They established landscapes as worthy of interest and a valid medium in painting they breached the academic rules of painting by adopting a freer style that gave more importance to color. They contributed to change the definition of what a work of art should be, not just a highly decorative and harmonious work showcasing masterful technique like many neoclassics tended to think. Before that, in their vision, it had to be emotionally charged and communicate something. And both Turner and Delacroix also paid attention to light and how it modified the aspect of things. Impressionist painters knew all this, 
they were perfectly aware of the movements and polemics that had come before them. So by the years 1860 and 1870, Romanticism in painting had turned less fashionable. The academic style in France especially was still very much neoclassical. And there was a bit of a sentiment of stagnation because no new approach or fashion seemed to be able to refresh the art scene. One or two centuries before, nobody would have cared about the absence of new things of novelty. But we were now in the 19th century. And with it came the faith in progress, constant discoveries. The economy was changing fast too. So that a discipline that didn't evolve was now seen as dying. And speaking of innovations, photography was now competing with painting. For centuries, portraits had been a, a large share of painters' work. They were commissioned by every person who could afford them. Photography was beginning to ruin this market. People could have their portrait made multiple times for a fraction of the cost. And photography also attacked the basis of academic painting. What's the point of developing extraordinary craftsmanship to achieve a realism that photography does maybe even better in a few minutes? Another technical innovation that became widely available at the time was synthetic pigments. For centuries, painters made their own paint, grinding pigments and mixing them with oil, with a solvent, this came with the job. At the end of the 19th century, it was now possible to buy paint in tubes, like today, that was easier and much cheaper. But it also freed painters from their studios. It was now easier for them to paint outside in a more spontaneous way and to reproduce in real time on their canvas the changing aspect of things with the changes in the light. Impressionist painters did not emerge in a day. Every year in Paris, there was an art event, an exhibition called the Salon, organized by the Fine Arts Academy, which embodied this academic style we have discussed and the painters that would later be called Impressionists were systematically refused at this exhibition for not abiding to the rules of academism. So they ended up organizing a separate event, and even though the critiques were very harsh, they seduced the public progressively, and they started to make a name for themselves. After a few years of resistance, the Academy finally had to accept their existence and 10 to 20 years later, their work was now mainstream and very popular. It had come to embody modernity in painting. The one painting that gave its name to Impressionism is called Impression Sunrise. Impression Soleil Levant by Claude Monet, who will come back to him. He was a major figure of the Impressionist movement. This painting depicts the port of Le Havre in Normandy at sunrise. There are few focal elements, just small boats at the foreground and the red sun and no form is outlined. The entire scene is taken in the mist and shapes in the middle distance are hard to identify. There seems to be masts, maybe smoke, trees or factory chimneys, cranes maybe. 
none of this is clearly defined. But this is not the point. The picture is all about observing how light of the sunrise plays with matter, with surfaces. We see that this is water because of the reflection of light on the surface. We see clouds. They are exactly of the same color as the rest, but their texture plays differently with light. This may question what we see when we watch around us. Maybe we could think that a photography would better capture the reality of our perception. But does it really? Because we also know that colors can change entirely due to light at dawn or at sunset. And the light on some surfaces like water can give unexpected colors. For a fraction of seconds, it may sparkle, and no photography can fully capture that, whereas this painting reflects one possible aspect of reality. It seems to vibrate, as if it was not just a flash, but a moment turned into a picture. If we look closer, the water surface reveals many more colors than the grayish blue. It is also white, yellow, gray, pink, green. When the painting was shown in 1874, it attracted very tough, very harsh criticism for looking unfinished and blurry and the term Impressionism was coined. It was intended to be a pejorative name for the style, but the Impressionists claimed it for themselves and it stayed. Monet's style evolved, but what stayed is this particular vibration in his works. They never feel completely still, and they give the impression that they depict a moment. Monet was very prolific. His biggest body of work is a series of about 250 paintings called the Nymphea, the Water Lilies. This series kept him busy for the last 30 years of his life, and it is an artistic journey. Four years he painted views of his flower garden, which had a pound and a water lilies, studying every possible variation of light and color, and how to depict them from sunrise to sunset. Monet started the water lilies in his 40s, when he was already a recognized, well-known painter. By the end of the 1880s, or the early 1890s, almost all the first impressionists had found recognition and commercial success. But his style kept evolving and tended towards abstraction in a way that is reminiscent of Turner's. In the last paintings, the water lilies are no longer distinguishable, and this particular vibration of uh, the picture that is common to all impressionists was the product of particular techniques. It all starts with uh, how paint is applied. The strokes of paint are short and thick. Painters don't draw lines or follow a contour. And when paint is applied, it is not mixed with other strokes around it. When you look close, there are no transitions between colors. This is invisible from far, but it creates an effect called simultaneous contrast. It makes the color appear more vivid to the viewer. The colors pop. Impressionist paintings rarely look dark or faded and even more because most painters never used black 
take out the darker tones from mixing various colors. And it makes sense because in nature, absolute complete black is exceptional. The complete absence of light. When we close our eyes, there is always a bit of light passing through. The impressionists also don't care for any effect of transparency. The canvas is opaque and the layers of paint are thick. This is a break from centuries of tradition in painting, especially with neoclassical techniques. Since the Renaissance, painters used very thin layers of diluted paint to create effects of texture and smooth the surfaces. Sometimes they showed off their technical skills by painting transparent veils, for example. And they would also typically start working on a canvas with a dark layer of paint, grey or brown from which they would make characters, landscapes or buildings emerge. The untouched part of the canvas would stay dark, and it tends to make many paintings from the Renaissance to the 19th century look darker. This effect was appreciated. Impressionists started with a white canvas, sometimes with the first layer of clear paint to smooth it, but all other shades were added later. And finally, the majority of Impressionist works were painted outdoors, and this impacted the choices of colors, because they paid a lot of attention to the reflection of colors on surfaces. And with the blue of the sky, blue strokes tended to spread all over the paintings. They made full use of new synthetic blue pigments. There was synthetic ultramarine, the typical deep blue color, with shades of purple that was very expensive and sought after before it was synthesized. And also Prussian blue, another deep Cold blue, cobalt blue, which was lighter and a bit grey, cerulean, which is a pigment with shades of green between blue and teal. And for all the main colors, they used new, cheaper alternatives like cadmium yellow or red. For a part, Impressionism is also a product of new discoveries from the chemical industry. It made vivid colors available at a cheap price, so they could use them without restraint, and it liberated the painters. They could go out and work with pre-mixed tubes, pigments already mixed with a solvent that came out of the tube ready to use instead of carrying heavy equipment to mix their colors before painting. It went well with the search for spontaneity. Claude Monet embodies the impressionist aesthetic the best, and he was also the most prolific. But there are numerous other painters who participated in the movement with their own approach. So let's take a look at some of them. Auguste Renoir is another prominent Impressionist. He met other Impressionists in the 1860s, when he was in his 20s and studying at the Paris Fine Arts School. Maybe more than others, he was influenced by the art of portraits from the previous centuries, and he first found success as a portrait maker which was not very common in Impressionist production. He made landscapes too, like his peers, but he became famous and successful with people's portraits or people's scenes. In 1876, he painted one of the most famous Impressionist works. 
It is called Dance at the Moulin de la Galette. The Moulin de la Galette was an entertainment venue in the north of Paris, in the district of Montmartre. Moulin is a windmill, and this windmill, in a district which is now surrounded by miles of urban area, was a remain of the time when Montmartre was a village. The owners turned it into a type of venue called a guinguette, an informal open-air place where people went to meet friends, drink, eat, dance, listen to singers, socialize. Most guinguettes had a working-class clientele. People were free on Sundays, and they would pay a visit in the afternoon and evening and they dressed up for that. They had limited means, but they would wear their Sunday clothes and uh, have fun for a few hours. Renoir was a frequent visitor, together with other Impressionists, and in this painting, he captured a scene, a typical Sunday afternoon. The painting is busy with plenty of characters, It is relatively dark. Renoir was the only major impressionist who used black sometimes. But it remains colorful and typical of impressionism with very fluid brush strokes and a richness of color that appears when we watch it from closer. The same spirit shows in many landscapes and portraits from the 1870s. But after the 1880s, Renoir parted away with Impressionism. He had been classically trained, and he was drawn to a more classical approach to painting. He kept working for decades. He died in 1919, in a style that was now rather out of fashion and it's a matter of taste, obviously, but many people find his later work less interesting. It is always sensual. He painted many women with a very delicate, intimate environment, with the light smoothly highlighting curves. But there is something slightly kitsch and maybe even campy for someone who showed such an original and visually rich body of work earlier in his life. With Impressionism being just a period in his career, he is often considered a heir to a long tradition of feminine portraits that dates back from the 16th century. Another painter who had an Impressionist period and later broke up with the Impressionists, was Paul Cézanne. He evolved towards new visual forms later in his life, and his entire body of work illustrates the evolution from Impressionism to other ways of expressions that followed it. In the 1870s, Cézanne was influenced by uh, Impressionism. He adopted the technique, at least part of it, but his visual style was somewhat harsher than Monet. His characters could be outlined. He introduced clear separations between colors, and the softness or the blurred halos of light that are present in many Impressionist works are almost absent from his. He lived between Paris and the south of France, and it is in the south that he kept tracing his path. He made numerous paintings of the same landscape, the Sainte-Victoire mountain near the city of Aix-en-Provence. Like Monet painting water lilies, He turned this landscape into an experimentation playground, working tirelessly on the effect of light and colors. He 
he had a passion for colors and kept searching for ways to make them speak, to reveal their essence. Over the years, his visuals turned increasingly geometric. He was progressively, and maybe unconsciously, turning real things into symbols, a purified, essential version of them. The mountain and its surroundings became a geometrical construction. Cézanne's evolution contains some of the aspects or preoccupations that fed art in the 20th century, especially at the beginning in movements like Cubism. There is this intuition that the world we see is full of visual pollution that hides it. It hides its true nature. And that an artist may find ways of revealing a form of truth. He may invent a language, not only visually, that uncovers the true reality or sheds light on another aspect of it. Even before he started to transform shapes, Cézanne's style was highly recognizable. He used planes of color, sometimes contoured, and worked on color with very characteristic brush strokes that give his surfaces a distinctive aspect. It makes you immediately recognize one of his work. Yet another painter was Edouard Manet, but to him Impressionism was the end of the road. He was from the previous generation. Manet was controversial from the start of his career. He was also classically trained and very cultured. He had visited Germany, the Netherlands and Italy to go see the works of old masters. When he opened the studio in the 1850s, there was a style among avant-garde artists called realism. The way they painted was rather classical, but their subject matters were not. Instead of embracing high culture, mythological and historical scenes, they chose to depict the contemporary world as it was including in its ugliness or vulgarity. Instead of painting heroes or kings, they picked workers, ordinary people in cafes, singers, beggars, gypsies. They had their public of collectors, but overall the good society found them gross and scandalous. Manet didn't mind. He probably enjoyed it even. Some of his famous early works include a painting called Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, The Luncheon on the Grass. This is not an impressionist painting, so I won't spend too much time on it. But it sparked controversy when it was revealed because it depicts two women naked, especially one at the foreground, having lunch with two dressed up men. The scene is absurd and to the audience of the time very irreverent because it draws inspiration from old masters like Titian from the compositions of mythological scenes too. And the canvas is very large, like for a serious work. But the topic is very mundane and for a viewer of the years 1850 it clearly hinted at prostitution. On top of that, it lacks the polish expected from a classical painting, especially the traits, the faces of the characters. Manet also took liberties with the rules of perspective, and the woman looks like a, a cutout. She is almost floating in the scene, as if she had been added to it accidentally. So it was judged absolutely gross on all counts, 
but to Manet and people who appreciated his work. This wasn't just a joke. There was some reality to the concept of what he was showing, and the strong reaction of the audience tends to validate that view. If it sparks offense or controversy, it is saying something about the time. Now, this idea that works of art may or should have a shock value has turned into a cliché. It is so expected that it's almost seen as proof of a lack of inspiration. But in the 19th century, it was a new thing. And this is part of the modernity of a painter like Manet. So when the first group of impressionists were in their 20s, they regarded Manet, the provocateur, as an inspiration for its absence of conformism and uh, his attempts at inventing new forms in visual art. They later befriended him and influenced him in his late works of the 1870s and early 1880s. He died in 1883. Like uh, a bar at the Folie Bergère, the impressionist touch is visible. Lines are looser, colors are applied side by side in brush strokes that are not blended, and there is a lot of attention paid to light and how it modifies the textures. This way of painting is like a transition style towards impressionism. There is not this feeling of dissolution of edges and absorptions of everything within light, like we have seen in Monet's work, for example, but it is no longer classical at all. We could go on with others like Camille Pissarro, Alfred Sisley, or Mary Cassatt. But to conclude with the last major impressionist, let's talk about Edgar Degas. He wouldn't have called himself an impressionist, and he was at odds with many principles that the impressionists followed, like painting outdoors, trying to be spontaneous, or using bright and dazzling colors. But still, he is best described as an impressionist, because not only did he know and befriend some of them, he painted similar scenes of Parisian life. He created unusual compositions that were off-centered. And more than anything, he constantly experimented with color and form like them, with a painting technique that was inspired by uh, Impressionists too. Degas had a, a conservative mindset when it came to his work. He would innovate, but he was classically trained in all the guidelines of academic painting and in the respect due to old masters. He initially wanted to be a painter of conventional historical scenes and be recognized as such, but rather quickly he departed from the academic style. He adopted angles that were unconventional. This only went further with the years. We'll see works with very uncommon viewpoints in a minute. And he stopped idealizing his characters, tending towards the realistic movement of the 1850s and 1860s. He had a lonely and melancholic personality that showed in many of his works. They communicate a sense of isolation sometimes. And uh, when his style was influenced by Impressionism, it gave one of his most famous works, a painting called L'Absinthe, the Absinthe, from 1876. Like for Manet's early works and many early Impressionist paintings, 
This one was panned by critics and called ugly and disgusting. Not just because of the style, but because of the image itself. A woman sitting alone inside a cafe is bad enough, but in a state of apparent drowsiness and boredom that was too much for the conservative audience. They expected art to be decorative and morally uplifting. This was clearly not. This may be attached to the Impressionist movement for the treatment of various elements, the dress in particular. It looks vaporous and blurry, with multiple shades from white to grey to brown. But the rest of the picture is made of straight lines and uh, stark contrasts, so it's almost as if the café and the characters were from two different dimensions. The tables and the seats are well defined. They are made of solid matter, whereas the woman looks evanescent, like a ghost, prisoner of a world made of sharp angles and cool surfaces. In her isolation, she barely is a part of this material world. She almost belongs to another dimension, and it is uncertain if she's going to solidify again or completely vanish. This is a deeply sad picture. In the same period, when he painted L'Absinthe, Degas started to increasingly paint ballet subjects, which is what he is most famous for nowadays. He was fascinated by dance and movement, and this theme also sold well. So he created scenes with dancers, and his angles, his viewpoints, were highly unusual, as if they belonged to a distracted spectator. Characters are cut, their faces out of the picture, some parts are left unfinished because they don't matter so much. In that sense, various art historians have considered he was continuing Impressionism in a different way. His compositions seem to reflect the movement of a spectator's eye as during a, a random glance, and they try to catch a snapshot. This is, properly speaking, Impressionism, the capture of a fleeting moment. As you see, all these artists brought something to the Impressionist movement, and they took from it too. They further developed techniques, or Impressionism was a step in their singular journey. There are also various artists called Post-Impressionists, who are from the generation just after the emergence of the Impressionist movement, who knew of it, and developed different precepts for the use of color, form and line. Van Gogh, who is hard to classify, maybe I'll make an, another video about him one day. Gauguin, Toulouse-Lautrec, Seurat. Seurat invented a way of painting with small points, it's called pointillism. As we have seen in their individual trajectories, many artists from this movement pushed towards new concepts. Monet approached abstraction, Cézanne, Cubism, and the transformation of natural shapes into geometrical forms. They all liberated painting from rigid rules and a certain conservatism that prevailed in the middle of the 19th century. This is why Impressionism is such an important movement in the history of visual art. And yet, however innovative it was and controversial at the beginning, 
it is also easily approachable. It is not hard to understand or appreciate, even without the knowledge of the technique or the intention. There is something almost magical about it in this moment in the long history of painting. It is at the same time innovative, creative, challenging, and yet it remains obviously aesthetical for a majority of people. Nowadays, when there are temporary exhibitions, be it in Paris, in London, in New York City, in Tokyo, this is the one style of painting that draws the biggest crowds, almost a century and a half after it was invented. This is all for tonight. I hope you enjoyed this overview. And again, if you would like more videos about painting, there are various in the playlist in the description. I now let you enjoy the music for a few more minutes. And I'll speak to you soon for another topic. Au revoir.